So first off, welcome to Stanford. I'm sure you've heard that a lot. Um, it's a wonderful place with a ton of opportunities. Um, I'll talk a little bit about what our group is doing. Um, I'll finish with a little bit of a plug for some of the classes we teach and I teach in ERE, which I think are pretty broadly applicable and interesting to students across um, the energy sector. I'm gonna to talk today about some work that really comprises these two areas, uh, comprise maybe two thirds of my group's research. Uh, other areas we're working on are uh, solar thermal, uh, energy storage, uh, solar forecasting, and some other uh, renewable energy uh, technologies. But I'll talk about uh, oil and gas um, uh, emissions intensity. So renewables are growing incredibly quickly. Uh, I've been working on energy climate interactions for about 20 years. Uh, I sort of got obsessed about 20 years ago. I've never felt more positive about the potential for the future. Things are looking really good. There's a lot of work to be done. There's going to be decades of work to be done, but a lot of pieces are falling into place. So this is very exciting. Renewables are growing incredibly quickly, but also gas demand is increasing quite rapidly, both in North America uh, and in Asia. There's a variety of reasons for this. Uh, one is clean power generation. Another is the desire for process uh, industrial or commercial heating without particulate matter. Uh, another is flexible generation of firm renewables. Uh, every day in California, including today, between about 4 and 7 uh, o'clock, as Lynn said, we ramp. We're going to ramp uh, today uh, 12 to 14 gigawatts of, of uh, natural gas power over the space of a few hours. That's more than the entire grid of almost every state in the country. Uh, we'll turn that on, right? And so flexible generation of firm renewables is going to be needed. Uh, a lot of interest in natural gas as an alternative vehicle fuel. So gas is, is with us, and in fact, gas demand is growing. Um, and all credible scenarios show decades of oil demand uh, remaining, and I'll show uh, some examples of that uh, on the next slide. Uh, for that reason, we need uh, improved methods to understand and reduce emissions from oil and gas uh, operations while we're still going to be using those. And I'll show some examples of our work in this area. So uh, Adam says oil demand is going to continue for the next few decades. Well, Adam is interested in oil, so of course he's uh, going to say something like that. He's not a neutral observer. Uh, this is not just me. Uh, so we took every projection we could find, including an uh, intergovernmental panel uh, on climate change projections from the year 2000 and the year 2016. 2000, we filtered for ones that were already rendered um, uh, inaccurate by the history that's elapsed since then. So we took all the ones that still could be possible. Uh, 2016, this is the newest set of, of integrated assessment model projections. We also took every projection for future demand we could find from oil companies, as well as from government and non-governmental organizations such as IEA, the International Energy Agency in Paris. Uh, you plot those, these are the, uh, the, cumul or these are the uh, yearly demand with uh, historical um, uh, consumption uh, by country there. So we have 100 and something countries here. Uh, here's the uh, projected future production, and then here's cumulated, okay? What you see here is that on the cumulative graph, we've consumed maybe 1.3 to 1.4 trillion barrels or 1,400 gigabarrels. Uh, over the course of uh, since the Industrial Revolution. Okay, this graph actually goes all the way back to uh, 1870. Uh, you'll see that even in the most optimistic scenario, so here's cumulative uh, consumption associated with this most aggressive IPCC mitigation scenario. So this is like a two degrees uh, mitigation scenario where the oil demand essentially um, uh, craters. Uh, we've got another trillion barrels plus uh, to be used over the over the century. And, and let, let me just reemphasize this. This is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Mitigation Scenario. This is not uh, ExxonMobil, okay? So maybe another, another trillion barrels of oil. So how do we reduce emissions? If oh, and okay, so here's a, uh, here's a little uh, a quiz that I sometimes give my students to illustrate this. Um, let's say X uh, commercial scale uh, airplanes were sold in the year 2017, the last complete year. X is, uh, I don't know what the number is, 700 or something like this. How many of those airplanes, let's say the number was 1,000, how many of those airplanes are still gonna be uh, in the air flying in the year 2050? Does anyone have a sense of what that number is? If we sold 1,000 last year, how many are gonna be left? Not zero. 
Uh, not quite 800. It'll probably be about 600 to 650. The average lifetime of a commercial aircraft is increasing, and the age at 50% retirements uh, is running about 35 years right now. Okay. So of the airplanes sold last year, 60% or so are going to be in the air in 2050. Okay, That's just the reality. When you spend $100 million on an airplane, um, you don't shut it off. That thing runs. <laughs> That's just the way business works. This is unfortunate, but true. Okay, so life cycle assessment of oil and gas operations. This is one area where we're working. So all, you know, all of this is just to motivate you know, why are we interested in working on this. Um, when you evaluate oil resources, you need what's called life cycle thinking. Life cycle thinking basically says, I want to evaluate the impacts of a particular option over its entire uh, value chain. Common examples of life cycle thinking or life cycle assessment that you guys are probably familiar with are questions of, uh, do I use a disposable uh, coffee mug or do I, a uh, coffee cup or do I wash my coffee mug? Do I use disposable diapers or do I wash uh, diapers, things like this. So these are common uh, plastic versus glass for Coca-Cola bottles, things like this. So these are common um, applications of life cycle thinking, but we need to apply this to oil and gas as well. What we really want are the minimal emissions across the entire value chain, all the way from exploring for the primary resource, drilling of wells, producing of oil, uh, processing it, shipping it to refineries, refining it, and then burning the fuels. Some resources, this is important to take this full value chain approach because some resources will score well in certain parts of the value chain, but less well in others. And so what you really want is the resource that's best uh, across the entire life cycle. Uh, here's an example of an oil value chain. You've got exploration, uh, separation and reinjection, and you transport it, refine it, refine, uh, send the product uh, uh, to the gas station and then you consume it. Some terminology here, well to tank is, is usually here. Well to wheels includes the product consumption in your vehicle. Uh, we built a model for this. As we've been working on it since 2009 or so. We call it OPGI, the Oil uh, Production Greenhouse Gas Emissions Estimator. Estimator is in bold here. What OPGI does it is it estimates emissions from an oil operation given engineering characteristics of that field. Things like depth, the quality of the oil, how much water is going to be produced, etc. A whole bunch of published papers. The model is completely open. This was developed with funding from the California Climate Agency, the California Air Resources Board. They've funded development this, of this tool for about nine years as part of the climate regulation in California. Uh, they need the numbers that this tool generates, um, as well as Department of Energy, Carnegie Endowment, Ford, uh, and Saudi Aramco. Uh, what does the model look like? It's a flow sheet kind of model approach. So any of you who've taken a chemical engineering class will recognize this kind of flow sheet. Uh, it's nice because all the equations are accessible, able to be modified, uh, examined, fully open source. Uh, we're shifting some work that we're doing in the group and, and some of our new students are gonna be working on this. Uh, one of the uh, pieces of criticism we've received over the years from industry is they wanna see uh, sort of standard stock chemical engineering tools used. So what we've done is we've used uh, one of these expensive uh, process simulation software uh, to run, in this case, this is an acid gas removal unit. Uh, we simulate the model, or we simulate the process 10,000 times, then we can actually fit an equation to predict, in this case, it's just a quadratic regression, to predict energy use in the boilers or electric work for pumps, and we can put that into our life cycle assessment model uh, to calculate the energy demand. So this is a big step forward for life cycle models. Typically, they don't tend to operate at this level of uh, kind of chemical engineering detail, so we're really trying to push the, the state of the art forward uh, in the modeling of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, we also have, have done a lot of work in trying to understand emissions from the global oil sector. So this is a paper I'm very proud of. It was just published in Science uh, two weeks ago or so uh, on August 31st. Uh, we had 24 co-authors from 16 institutions. For the first time, we constructed a global um, estimate at the field level of emissions from global uh, oil and gas operations. So this is essentially every oil field in the world, about 9,000 oil fields representing 98% of global oil production. A funny, um, for those of you who have ex excessive ambitions and are entering graduate school, in the summer of 2006, I was giving my qualifying exam, and I had the audacity slash insanity to propose in my oral exam. Some of you guys are gonna be doing this soon. Uh, I propose that I'm gonna build a model to assess the greenhouse gas emissions from oil and gas operations, and I'm gonna model every oil field in the world. One of the guys on my committee said, great project, this would be super interesting, it's gonna take you a decade. Um, 
literally almost 12 years later to the day. Um, so, you know, 800 references, years of data collection. We built a lot of data integration methods um, uh, to, uh, using R and other sorts of uh, SQL languages to basically integrate uh, many, many data sources. And we can start to target these high emitting sources. Um, we think the potential reductions are something like 50 gigatons of CO2 uh, over the course of the century. That's in relation to about an 800 to 1,000 gigaton budget to stay under two degrees. So 50 gigatons is, is non-trivial if we can get these high emitting sources and make them look more like Norway, for example, is down here. Uh, we looked at variation by country. So some countries are really good, Norway, other countries are really bad, Canada, Algeria, Venezuela. Depends a lot on the resource. Uh, Canada has great environmental management rules, but their resource tends to be uh, heavy and hard to extract. Okay, another area we work on is methane detection. Uh, methane is a potent greenhouse gas, as Lynn said. It's emitted from oil and gas operations. It has a high global warming potential. We want to uh, develop ways to vastly reduce the cost of finding methane leaks and fixing them. We went out to a test site where they have metered leaks from real oil and gas equipment. They can basically turn on the leak and tell you exactly how much uh, leakage is happening. Uh, we gathered about a million frames of video over the course of a week at different distances, different pieces of equipment, different leak rates, different sun angles, different wind conditions, et cetera. So we have about a million uh, image of, uh, hours of video using a $100,000 uh, infrared camera that lets you see temperature sufficiently uh, with sufficient high fidelity that, for example, you can see how much oil is in a tank. You can also see normally uh, transparent methane, which is very active in this mid-IR spectrum. This is in the three micron uh, window where uh, CH bonds are very active. And so that's actually methane coming off of a tank in North Dakota. Okay, so we want to take those videos and do automatic detection. So here's uh, six leak classes. There's this vent stack. This is a big leak. This is no leak, All right? Okay, so those are some example frames of video. We want to be able to detect that. We're using CNNs, convolutional neural networks, which are an image processing technique. Um, and we're training the CNN to see plumes. First, we process it. So you take a raw video stream. Here's a leak. Uh, I can then uh, binarize it or uh, increase the contrast. No, yeah, that's contrast increase. That's not uh, binarizing. Then I can use uh, edge detection to detect change. So these are actually change vectors from one frame to another. How does that pixel move, basically? So I'm detecting movement. Then I can threshold it and say, select all pixels where there's a certain amount of movement. Those are yes. That's a yes pixel for a flame, uh, for a plume of gas. And then we can recognize that. And hopefully what we think is automatically detect that and then estimate how big it is. So that you could have something like a camera watching every oil field and it would report in and say, hey, I see a leak on tank number six. Here's a video of it. Send someone out, go fix it. Okay. So this is pretty fun. Um, another thing, this is super cool. So this is my uh, uh, handsome postdoc, uh, Arvind. He's actually a professor now, so he's, I need to change the slide. Um, uh, he's left Stanford onto greener pastures. Um, we're working with the Environmental Defense Fund on what we call the Mobile Monitoring Challenge. This was three weeks of field tests with 10 participating companies who are all developing, uh, in about half the cases, drones, uh, and the other half aircraft or um, two cases of light aircraft or trucks that can drive and detect emissions without stopping. So the idea is these are mobile, uh, very rapid, so that they can be much, much cheaper. You could survey 100 well sites in a day, for example. Okay, so this could dr drastically drop the cost of methane detection. So what we did is we went to two different sites in Sacramento and Colorado. Uh, we were releasing gas at these various points. Companies were driving their sensors and trying to say, do I see a leak or do I not? Single blind format, so we were controlling it. They didn't see anything. Then all 10 companies had to report what they saw to us, and then we're going to publish the results uh, with names and everything attached. This is you know, straight up exactly how these companies did. We're seeing, we can't uh, talk about the results in detail yet, but we're seeing some really positive results. Some companies have really high detection fidelity um, and do, did an, a few of the companies just did an amazing job. Um, and so this technology, this mobile detection technology, I think is, is, uh, is here, okay? Uh, so uh, this is, uh, we're releasing at that site in Colorado where we did the, uh, the videos for plume detection. 
Uh, this is a rig that we set up in Sacramento to do larger leaks. Uh, these guys are only permitted to leak a certain amount per day, about 150 standard cubic feet per hour in uh, sane units. Um, uh, one scuff is about 20 grams, 150, a couple kilograms an hour. Um, yeah, standard cubic feet, I'm sorry. Um, I, I don't know what to say. Uh, I, I apologize. Um, that's too small for some of the aircraft. So these guys here could release a much larger volume. And these uh, here is where we tested the light aircraft. So here's the idea is uh, mount a camera, in most cases an infrared or hyperspectral camera on the underside of an airplane. And then you can fly by at you know, 150 to 200 miles an hour at a few thousand feet. Uh, and the idea is you could, for example, uh, survey wide swaths of oil and gas fields, um, uh, look for emissions at thousands of wells. So we needed to be able to release a larger amount. So we did that up in Sacramento uh, with all the appropriate permits. This was out in farmland, and so there was no potential for any uh, sort of safety uh, or human health uh, concerns associated with the gas release. Uh, so that went well. We did three weeks of, of releases. Um, we're analyzing the data uh, right now. Uh, Picaro is a Stanford uh, spinoff. Um, uh, they do what's called cavity ring down spectrum. Uh, spectrometry, very, very high precision parts per billion level uh, detection of methane. And so they basically, in our case, they drove a drone uh, pass that had the sensor on it. Uh, they're measuring the concentration and they use that plus the wind uh, fields that they're measuring to estimate uh, the leakage rate. Uh, these guys uh, were drones. Um, uh, actually, these two were drones as well. These folks, Aris, they're another Bay Area startup. Uh, they've got a sensor on a vehicle. Uh, Kairos is another Bay Area startup. They're an airplane, as is Ball Aerospace. Uh, Ball Aerospace is a longtime contractor who's built a lot of the satellites for NASA, et cetera. So they've got a really nice camera system on an airplane, uh, as well as one university team from Calgary. Uh, you know, when we did this, we were partnering with Environmental Defense. They uh, coughed out the money for the experiments. We we're thinking, oh, we got to really hit the bushes and hope we get 10 companies to participate. I was thinking we were going to say yes to everyone. We ended up getting 28 applications, including a number from companies that I didn't even know were working on methane. Uh, we ended up selecting 12 and 10 uh, actually did measurements. Uh, They're going to say, do I see the leak? Uh, yes, no. Estimate the leak size uh, and give us the location and time of where they think the, uh, the leak occurred. Then we're going to generate things like cumulative, cumulative probability for detection as a function of leak size, quantification accuracy, uh, and the effect of conditions, hopefully something on the effect of weather conditions for detection accuracy. Um, what we're seeing roughly, and we're drafting right now to submit this fall, what we're seeing roughly is um, some of the technologies are very, very good uh, at uh, uh, seeing the leaks. Uh, very few of the technologies to maybe none of the technologies are very good at quantifying the leaks. It's actually a quite a difficult inverse um, transport and dis dispersion problem. So you have a set of concentration measurements. For example, you drive by a well pad and you're measuring methane and the methane increases and drops. What kind of emission rate does that correspond to? It's actually quite a challenging problem. So I think yes, no, do we see a leak or do we not? It's really possible. Very fast, very cheap. This is coming. It's going to be great. Um, uh, and uh, but quantification is probably going to be hard. So that's it. That's just a sort of a short preview of a bunch of stuff that's happening in our group. Um, I guess it's time for questions. That satellite be used for detection. There is one commercial satellite in the air. Presently, it's called GHGSat. It's uh, out of Montreal. Um, the current uh, version of the satellite isn't working super well. They've released some preliminary images, but they're working on a second gen. Environmental Defense Fund raised some amount of money. I'm not sure. I hear numbers of $50 million or so. And they're actually building a satellite they're calling MethaneSat. It's going to go in the air within the next three years or so. And hopefully, they're going to be able to observe about 80% of the world's oil and gas fields. The challenge with satellites, so this is amazing, right? If you have a satellite that visits the whole world every day, this is like great. The challenge is typically you can only see large events. And so um, I still think it's going to be very worthwhile because if you look at the statistical distribution of methane emissions, a large fraction of the leakage comes from pretty infrequent large events. 
So really, it's going to be a big benefit, even if you can only see really big stuff from space. You can look every day. You don't need permission from companies. Anyone can see it. They're going to put all the data online. So hopefully, the idea of what the EDF is doing is it'll look like Google Earth. You can zoom in uh, anywhere. Anyone can see it from the web. And you can see a methane cloud over a facility. And environmental regulators or other folks, can anyone can access the data. So yeah, that's a, that's a very uh, good question. Lots of people are thinking about it. They're saying 2022, I think, is their target. That may be a little ambitious, but possibly doable. Is there any work on um, estimating to the extent you should methane emissions offset the benefits of fuel switching from coal to natural gas in terms of like yeah, so the, for those of you who didn't hear the question, the question was, um, have we looked at the benefits of coal to gas switching uh, in the context of the methane emissions? This really was the impetus for a lot of the, the explosion in work on methane emissions. It's, uh, sorry for the bad pun, bad metaphor. Mm -hmm. um, uh, a, a real sort of um, uh, explosion, I'll do it again. Um, a real sort of explosion of, of research on methane um, over the last five years, a lot of it motivated by this question of should we actually switch to gas, is it, is it actually better? We haven't written any papers uh, explicitly looking at that. At the most recent, we had a paper published in Science, it was a minor co-author, uh, rolling up about five years of work, Environmental Defense did the roll up. Uh, they think the leakage rates are about 60% higher than EPA says uh, in the US, but still significantly lower than any kind of threshold you'd want uh, to make uh, coal versus gas good. So it looks like coal versus gas trade-off is still quite good. Vehicles, it doesn't look like uh, CNG and, and LNG vehicles are going to have much climate benefit. That's probably where things stand right now. It may have other air quality benefits, right? Diesels uh, can be polluting, but, but for climate, it doesn't look great. Uh, could you give us an idea of the estimated cost of the companies of uh, detection and mediating of the We've we've got a field campaign up in Canada right now, and we're paying two to three thousand dollars a day for a team of two guys who have one of these hundred thousand dollar cameras and goes out to look. They can see it depends on the complexity of the site. If it's got a lot of equipment on it, they'll see one site a day. If it's they're very simple, those they can see ten sites a day. Really, what you need is you need this to be that, that's too expensive. This is hundreds of dollars to thousands of dollars per site. What you really need is $10 per site visit, something like that. And so I think you need something that looks like a smoke detector in your house, but it just sits there. You stick it to a piece of equipment, it radios if it smells methane, right? It just uses the mesh network or something else to send an alert home. Um, a lot of these sites aren't manned uh, frequently. Someone goes out once a week or less. Uh, so you need something that sits there, or you need something like a camera that sits on a truck. And as men come to, to do work on the facility, the camera's just watching and radioing home with problems. It needs to be effectively zero labor, uh, fast, uh, and cheap. And I think actually with these sensors, we're probably a lot closer than some people are thinking. And so then you're talking 10 to $20 per site per visit, and you can easily save that in the gas savings alone. And so then the, then the companies are gonna start getting excited because, hey, I'm paying 20 bucks a site to, to detect gas, but I'm saving $100 worth of lost gas per site. And so, you know, this is just, this is win-win, right? We want win-win solutions where the companies see this as a no-brainer, want to do it automatically. Why would I not do that? Right now, the perception in industry is that this is finicky, expensive, labor-intensive. You got to get guys in a truck. They got to go out there. The camera's $100,000, you know. Uh, so the perception in industry right now is that it's troublesome, and, uh, but we need to get it to where it's effectively automatic, I think. It's probably a very simple question, but uh, what's the big challenge in containing methane? There are no manufacturing solutions to less leaks. Um, you know, there's been a lot of work, uh, you know, done on that over the decades. I think the short version is, and we've got folks in our in our department who do lab work with high pressure gases. The short version is that uh, nature abhors a vacuum. Actually, what what nature doesn't like is a pressure differential. And so that gas relentlessly, 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, uh, you know, is at high pressure and wants to escape through any sort of orifice. What you find is a lot of uh, wear and tear. It's out in the elements. You get a lot of thermal expansion, uh, cooling and warming cycles. You get a lot of vibration. Uh, you get a lot of reciprocating motion in well pumps uh, and in compressors. 
And so just what ends up happening is that um, seals, gaskets, flanges, things like this wear. Um, and, uh, you know, to, to use the, the cleaner version of an analogy, stuff happens, right? Uh, so sort of stuff happens. And um, so really, I, I think hoping that we're going to come up with systems that never leak is hard. But thinking about ways to very rapidly find a problem when it occurs, I think is totally doable. And so, um, so yeah, so that's where I've been focusing my, uh, yeah, my efforts. High pressure gas wants to escape is the sort of the short version. <laughs> How big of an improvement can you offer, like the fields in Canada that you mentioned at the beginning that you were evaluating, that just have you know sources of oil that are low quality and that already will admit the whole lot of CO2? What we see globally is that what's driving a lot of that curve is flaring. So we're doing a lot of work with satellite-based flaring estimation and going to be doing more. So these red ones are ones where gas is being burned essentially because there's no market use for it. There's no pipe. There's no way to get it to people who will pay for it. So they just burn it. So globally, that's probably the big driver. But the second one is heavy, this blue here. And heavy resources, basically the way to think about it is that there's more carbon and less hydrogen. So these are longer chain molecules. They're stickier. They're like a tar and asphalt or a bitumen rather than an oil that flows easily. So when you have this sort of situation, a couple of things happen. You end up steaming the oil or heating it to get it to flow. So like butter in a saucepan, it starts to melt and, and flows easily. And then you have a lot of hydrogen addition or carbon rejection required to turn it into fuels that we use. And so there's some inherent challenges with those resources. There's a lot of people working on alternatives like low carbon hydrogen generation or ways to essentially leave the hydrogen, leave the carbon in the ground. So for example, coke or chemically processed biologically, in some cases, the resource underground so that what comes out is very hydrogen rich. Uh, and then you leave most of that carbon in the subsurface. So there's a lot of people working on it. It is pretty challenging. I think this red stuff, the flaring, that's a management problem. We just need to decide that this is not okay. This is three or 4% of global gas production. Uh, you know, this is ridiculous. Uh, we need to move past this. Um, there's a lot of poor people in the world who could use the energy. There's a lot of uh, need to reduce climate emissions. Let's not burn three or 4% of world gas supply uh, for no good reason. This is just crazy. So I think this, we just need to decide that this is not acceptable and put management and rules and regulations in place. So that's where I'm most excited about. Maybe I shouldn't be giving people, but I don't know. That's good. Yep. Okay, let's thank uh, Adam again. All right. Thanks, everyone.